we all live in a world where data transforms the way we think learn create and do a lot of other stuff and the recent boom in technologies such as ai machine learning and virtual reality has only caused our lives to undergo a tectonic shift but have you ever wondered how does data help businesses and individuals predict what steps they should take next or how does a youtuber or a content creator know about the next content piece which can make him or her go viral and also how do ott platforms like netflix and amazon prime recommend to you the next set of series and movies which you should watch well don't worry because hey we are to answer all of that with an ex columbia university professor and the instructor of the immensely popular coursera course on machine learning eric siegel eric siegel is a data scientist a coursera instructor and a leading consultant who makes machine learning easy to understand and captivating he is also the founder of predictive analytics world and deep learning world conference series which serves more than 17000 attendees all over the world in this episode eric talks about his journey of teaching computer science and ai at columbia university how you can start your own journey in the data space about the metaverse and also how you can use data to your advantage and a lot more If you are a student, an entrepreneur, a content creator, a freelancer or even a working professional, you should definitely not miss out on this video. I promise you that through this video you are going to learn a lot about the crazy world of data, what it means to be a data scientist and how technology can bring in a radical change in the society. So if you are new to the channel, do hit the like button and subscribe so that you never miss out on such an informative video like this one. Now without any further ado, let's just jump right Right in and hear out from Eric Siegel. Welcome to the podcast, Eric. I am truly honored to have you on the show today. How are you doing? Great. Thank you, Surya. It's great to be here. Thanks Eric and I you know I vividly remember those days when I started doing your course era course on machine learning and predictive analytics and what I loved about the course is the way you break that complex information down in a very fun and easy to understand way so where did all this inspiration and love to explore the data and tech world stem out from and how did you essentially start your journey in this space Well I I got interested in machine learning uh in college um and that really solidified as i began graduate school so you know i i as a kid i was fascinated with the philosophy behind the idea of artificial intelligence so that was the inception but now flash forward many years and i'm actually kind of anti ai in the sense that i think that the concept promises too much but machine learning is a very well defined uh technology and does something real which is that it learns from data to make per individual predictions or classifications so if you have a bunch of photographs of of cats and dogs it, it can learn from that to distinguish between the two if you have a bunch of historical data of which customers canceled and which customers did not cancel it can find a predictive model that is going to do as best a job as possible to put probabilities on your current customers as to how risky it is that they're going to also uh cancel. So um this idea of learning from data is very generally applicable and the group of methods is lots of different technical approaches to learn from that data and to make a model that makes these per individual predictions. Um and that's that's machine learning. So that's I got there because of my childhood fascination with the concept of AI and I see it as the um only way that we know to even start approaching the complexity of whatever the human mind is uh with a computer but it turns out to be not just philosophically interesting obviously it's very um practically applicable so also known as predictive analytics when um when you learn from the data you make the model now you're using that model to to change or inform operations such as how to target marketing who's most likely to respond target retention offers who's most likely to cancel target fraud investigations which transact transaction is most likely to be fraudulent target um 
credit decisions, which applicant for a credit card is most risky to turn out to be a bad debtor. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. So it just goes on and on the wide applicability um, of machine learning um, it is is very unusual. It just basically applies to all the main large scale things that we do um, as organizations. That's really interesting. And I was also, you know, recently reading your book, uh, Predictive Analytics, The Power to Predict Who Will Click, Buy or Die. So that was really a valuable uh, book for me in terms of uh, the, a brief intro to this field. And, uh, you know, you have also taught machine learning and AI as a professor at the Columbia University and mm-hmm. also the immensely popular machine learning course on Coursera. So how did that happen? And how has your experience been transitioning from teaching at Columbia to teaching millions online? Well, we haven't hit millions online, but I... Uh, obviously we're headed in that direction uh, (laughs) because the number of students only increases. It never decreases. Uh, um, You know, teaching for me has always been something I get a lot of pleasure from because I really enjoy um, taking these concepts that so many people in my life that were never involved in computer science, friends and family, and I would see their eyes glazed over as soon as I, when I was a kid, I would try to describe the, the hacking, the programming I was doing on my Apple II Plus as a kid. Uh, when I was in college, I would try to de- describe to friends and family what a computer science major was and why I was interested in it. And then, you know, it, it continues. But the fact is this, the concepts are, um, are, are, not don't really require a rocket science degree They're, they should be they are relevant they should be accessible to everyone so um when i was in graduate school it became more and more clear to me that in addition to executing on technology i loved teaching about it and as a professor at columbia in addition to the grad level courses on machine learning and ai um, i was also teaching the undergraduate intro to computer science even for uh, non-majors, the elective, they call it computer science for poets. Um, And uh, I've always gotten a big kick out of that side of my personality of of seeing how um, clear and interesting um, can I make technology to less technical people or to newcomers. That's really interesting. And uh, I actually also want to know about how did you go on to build that Coursera course? Because I've never seen such a captivating course on that oh, subject before. Okay. Um, well, I had an all, I had a, I'd been teaching a two day course. Basically after I left uh, academics and was no longer a professor, I became a consultant in, um, uh, in business applications of machine learning. So to me, machine learning, the concept, the technology was originally the thing most exciting to me. And that's where a lot of technologists come from. And a lot of practitioners and machine learning come from the fascination about the core methods that learn from data. Um, And that's where I began. But then when it came to applying the concepts in real world, um, well, it certainly applies in plenty of places like healthcare, um, manufacturing, climate technology, um, computer security. I was involved in a startup that did it for computer security. And we cover these areas, you know, we cover examples of that in in my book. That's why we've got the click, buy, lie, die uh, rhyming scheme in in the title, in the the courses, um, in our conference series um, that I started. I started a conference series in 2009. It's called Predictive Analytics World, and it has all these different vertical focus um, uh, for business, financial services, climate technology, healthcare. uh, industry 4.0 and then deep learning world sister conference so we can come back to to the conference a bit later if you want but yeah. um, my point is that despite that cross industry applicability for me as far as hands-on application um, what I was what I was interested in is uh, how it applies in business that's those were the kinds of projects that I want to work on since the return on investment can be measured in a very concrete way. You know, how much more profit does this targeted uh, marketing effort um, produce? How much more ROI does this new targeted fraud investigation scheme work? These things can be quantified. It's very tangible and concrete exactly how much uh, benefit you're getting from 
from this. So let's see, I was working my way back to why my focus was on business and you'd asked about the course, right? So when I broke out from academics, I was like, well, now I'm just a consultant. Anybody want to hire me? I started doing um, hands-on projects, but I also wanted to continue teaching. So when I taught, I my, my courses focused mostly on business applications and I was teaching mm-hmm. two day seminar. Um, and then I made an online version. So the Coursera course, and it's also available at machinelearning.courses. Um, that, um, uh, that course was sort of the newest, updated, most expanded, um, and in terms of the video, much better production um, of my older online course. And the Coursera course came out a year and a half ago. Um, so, you know, the curriculum comes out of my experience as a researcher, as a university professor, and then as um, as an author and hosting this conference where we have so many different case study examples come and present. That's the point of the conference. So I've been accruing all these examples and concepts and and um, I wanted to lay it out in as much a completed way as possible. Now, a big focus on that and a big focus on my work in general is not just the core technology and this is probably the biggest takeaway through and I I'll probably try to circle back to this with whatever questions you continue to ask me here's the big takeaway it's the business side it's the business process management the leadership practice of how you use this technology that's most important the core technology the number crunching the rocket science part That's also very important, and that's where 99% of the focus today, both in as far as the hands-on technical practitioners, the experts, and all the hype, and all the excitement and enthusiasm from management and executives, 99% of the focus is on the core technology. Unfortunately, that's missing half of the equation you need to actually generate value. Because what you need is a practice that involves the corporation. This isn't just a core technology you plug in. This is a change to major operations and organization. The output, the predictions from a predictive model are only going to produce value if they are used in deployment. If the pro- probabilities that they're producing, will this customer cancel? Is this a good risk uh, credit application? All of these probabilities only help if they then inform, are integrated into, and affect the large-scale processes, the operations, the decisions that the business is making on a daily basis. That is a big change. Change management is a big thing in business because when the larger the business, the larger the scale, the larger the stakes, the more there is to gain, but the more resistance there will be to change. And And as it turns out, most predictive models that were produced by data scientists with the intention of deployment in order to actually produce value don't get deployed. Most of the projects fail in that respect. We just recently released a poll uh, survey results showing that most data scientists, most the majority of data scientists say that only between zero and 20% of the models that they generated with the intention of deployment actually get deployed. And the reason for this mishap and this um, problematic state of the industry is that everyone's just focusing on the core tech rather than understanding, hey, this is an organizational paradigm. It requires a very particular leadership practice. My course covers that. It covers both sides. The vast majorities of, of books and courses really just focus on the core technology side. Since you focused a lot on uh, value, so is value always calculated in terms or uh, or measured in terms of ROI, or does it have a qualitative aspect to it as well? Um, well, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> as much as possible in business, you know, we want to quantify the value uh, of anything, whether we're using machine learning or any initiative. It, if you can quantify the benefit. Um, that's the name of the game. That's the way corporations are generally run. But obviously, it's not the mm-hmm. only way they're run. Anytime you try to estimate the return on investment of a project, any project that's not yet been executed, it, it's only an estimation. Everyone knows that things could go wrong and it may not pan out as, as well. Um, so there's always that sort of human or qualitative uh, side to it. 
And then if you go, so I, I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I, I like focusing on those kinds of business applications of machine learning because it's a more direct, uh, clear way to measure the value in a quantitative way. But when you go yeah. to the other places, you know, they're just important. Targeting, um, targeting healthcare, targeting um, online security to try to detect viruses and, and all other kinds of online attacks. Um, these things can be harder to measure. So just the overall field of information security, you know, if you're selling a product in information security, you're selling a feeling of security. Right. It's the same as if you're selling um, a security product that protects a person's home with cameras and detect, detect sensors and everything. What's the return on investment if I buy a security system for this house? Uh, that's hard to measure, right? There is a, qua yeah. a qualitative side to it that's very important because, because obviously uh, security is, is important. We're not saying it's not important. I'm simply saying it's not as uh, easy in, in many cases to measure the return on investment. So I don't know. I mean, by, by your question is basically, you know, to what degree are we going with our human hunch? And, uh, yeah. and, and the ir ironic thing is you can't put a number on that you, by definition. How do you quantify the extent to which you shouldn't be quantitative? <laughs> and you also <laughs> referred to this term of deployment of predictive models. So can you, for our listeners, explain that term a little bit? Uh, and for anyone who's, you know, new to this field. So what does uh, deployment actually mean? Oh, so deployment is when you're actually using the um, predictive model. So in mm -hmm. general, on sort of technically, there's two stages. One is you learn from the data, then you use what's been learned. So you're going to have a bunch of historical data which of these credit applicants turned out to be good risks and which turned out to be bad debtors and you know defaulted on their loan so you've got the historical data from which to learn the learning process the rocket science part the machine learning algorithm the predictive model these are all different words for the same thing generates a model so what's been learned from that historical data in the form of patterns rules uh, uh, or mathematical formula um, is called a model. And then when you want to use that, now you look at a, at a new applicant and you want to say, what's mm -hmm. the probability that this is going to be a bad debtor, that they will default in the first five years of their loan or something like that, whatever the time window is. <clears throat> um, the job of that model, the whole point of that learning process is to generate this model that can now be used to calculate that to estimate with a calculation that probability. Now the internals of the model, you know, can vary. It depends on the methodology you're using. So it can be very simple, straightforward, and relatively easy to understand as a human, such as if then business rules. If the customer lives in, you know, a major metropolitan area and they're in this age range and they have this salary range, et cetera, et cetera, then, you know, they've got a, a four times higher than average risk of, of uh, defaulting within the first year, something like that. So you have those if then things that would often yeah. be in the form of what's called a decision tree. A decision tree is one way to encapsulate those kinds of if then rules. Other cases, it's much more um, difficult to understand. As they say, it's opaque. It's more like a black box. You can't see into it. You can literally see into it, but it's hard to understand even by the most technical practitioners because it sort of becomes a soup of mathematics that most classically applies in the case of a neural network. So as you get more complex in the models, um, the models can become more adept, although there's very much diminishing returns, and they also yeah. become more difficult to understand. So whatever it is, the model's the thing you've learned from the data, and now in deploy, the word deployment means you're actually using it in the field. You're actually scoring, or, or that is to say, calculating the probability with it for individuals, and now that probability is being used to inform um, and improve existing operations. That's a very incredible journey of ad and uh, you have also worked for quite a while in the startup ecosystem with co-founding two ventures, Cargo and Counterstorm. So can you tell us a bit about those, uh, your experiences building them and the major learnings which you got from there? Sure. Yeah, I mean, it was a great opportunity to work on those companies, um, uh, at those companies. 
uh, because I was straight out of academics. I went straight, I went college straight to six years of a PhD program. Um, and you know, so you get your master's degree along the way. And, uh, so you're basically already a PhD candidate from the very beginning. So that was six years also at Columbia university where then I was on the faculty for three years. So I went doot, doot, doot. And I was always in academia, um, other than a couple summer positions at computer companies and IBM, uh, research labs and, and these kind of things in the summer. Um, and, uh, um, so then straight out of that, I was suddenly in the, what they call the real world, right outside of academics. And, um, um, so what I was learning was sort of like how people interact and the, 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 the new vocabulary, the concepts, um, and then the harder lessons on, as you take a step back and you look at, I mean, the first of these two, um, startup companies was literally what the classic dot bomb, um, because it, it went down at the same time that the bubble burst, um, around 2000 in the dot com space. And the reason we weren't robust as as with most of these early startups we weren't robust enough to survive that is because i would say in the case of actually both of these companies um we hadn't clearly enough to find our target niche it was a little bit let's try to do too many different things at the same time so the idea of focus and i applied this very much after that when i became an independent consultant you, you mean that's sort of like a startup company but you're basically a one person company and you do you know so the the overhead's a lot lower. You know, the overhead for being a startup, uh, for being a consultant is $10 a month for your website. <clears throat> um, uh, the overhead's a lot lower, but you know, you still need to make ends meet and the same concept applies. You need to have a focus. You need to, your, your offering needs to be focused well enough so that you're going to be attracted to people who have a very particular need, um, and that you'll stand out even though you haven't yet established a name for yourself. So that's the same dilemma with any entrepreneurial endeavors. It's, it's very, you know, it, it's, it's very, uh, um, uh, a tried and true. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's such a fundamental, but so often overlooked to have a market niche for your business yeah. to have that focus. Yeah. Yeah. And startups, you know, are really fascinating in a sense that they are, also very agile and especially here in India, the startup wave has just begun and quite uh, recently Shark Tank has uh, finally entered the country. So now I want to deep dive a little bit into machine learning and AI since you have worked extensively in this space, both in academia and the industry. So how would you explain these concepts to anyone who is new to this field and where does predictive analytics lie in this entire spectrum? Predict predictive analytics is basically a synonym for machine learning? Well, it's almost a synonym. It depends on context. Um, predictive analytics, another way to think of it is, is it's a, it's a major subset of business applications of machine learning. So if you're using machine learning to detect, is there a traffic light in this picture as part of a self-driving car, um, you probably don't use the term predictive analytics. But if you're in the business space and you're using predictive analytics to target fraud investigation and, and marketing and all these mm -hmm. kinds of applications, you know, uh, online ads, um, you might just use the word predictive analytics instead of machine learning. <clears throat> um, you know, machine learning for a while was really uh, only used in, in, in the academic and research and development context. But the terminology has changed. And thankfully, now the world's uh, even in outside of academia is, is using machine learning and you calling it what it always was called, um, you know, from back in the sixties. Um, uh, unfortunately in terms of terminology though, we've also started adopting this, um, hyperbolic word, artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence. Um, sometimes it's simply meant as a synonym to machine learning, but it's, uh, more often than not, it conveys uh, a misleading information about what's possible and where we're headed in the development of the technology. Um, anthropomorphizes that the machine that is it's, it treats the machine. Anthropomorphizes is sort of like if you have a cartoon of, of, of a dog and the dog is talking, right? Turning something to have so it has humanistic uh, uh, characteristics. And psychologically, we're doing that to machines by calling it artificial intelligence. 
I think that artificial intelligence is a great word if you're having a philosophical conversation or if you're creating a science fiction movie. And, and I, don't, I don't just mean that as a joke. In both of those con contexts, I love it. Um, but when you're trying to define a technology, especially naming what's supposed to be a field of technology, um, there's a big problem by using the word intelligence because it is nothing but subjective. So yeah. AI is a bit hyperbolic, um, but basically, you know, machine learning is where strides are being made, where we're seeing the capacity to generate models um, from data. Now, one of the most fundamentals when you come into this is sort of, and kind of goes along with the sort of AI magical thinking stuff is just how fantastically amazing are these models? How well do they predict? Do they know with 100% accuracy? And the answer to that is it depends on the domain. So if you're looking at a photograph, is there a traffic light in this picture? You can ex achieve extremely high performance. And that's why there's the promise of self-driving cars. Self-driving cars, I think, are going to take a lot longer to become fully autonomous than most people realize. And there's a lot of incremental steps as it gets adopted in society. But there is the promise and potential there for sure. And that's partly because these kinds of tasks, these visual tasks, you can get computers um, mm -hmm. to start to really approximate and even surpass what a human can do with their eyeballs, right? Um, on the other hand, if you're trying to predict human behavior, as in the case for many of the business applications that we call predictive, predictive analytics, will this customer cancel their subscription? Uh, is this transaction going to turn out to be fraudulent? You don't have a crystal ball. Humans can't make those predictions extremely well. Um, and you yeah. can't expect a machine to be magical or clairvoyant. What the machine can do is predict better than guessing. So in those kinds, in those kinds of areas, we're talking about models that aren't ex, that aren't um, supernatural, but rather they're extremely valuable because they do predict better than guessing. So I call that the prediction effect. A little prediction goes a long way. Predicting better than guessing, and you can do back of the napkin return on investment arithmetic, uh, you know, which I do in most of my speeches and in the course, and it shows, hey. All we have to do is tip the odds in these numbers games that we're already playing with mass marketing and making credit decisions, et cetera, et cetera. All the main things that we do as businesses, if we tip those, tip the odds a bit, it's, it's all a numbers game. It's all risky business in one way or another. And many of these decisions are wrong. Most mail that we received in, in the mailbox is junk mail, right? It goes straight into the recycling bin because they were wrong, but it, they have to be wrong. They have to play this, cast a wide net and play this numbers game, right? Lots of medical um, diagnostic tests um, are just going to come out negative most of the time, not because the doctor was wrong to apply the test, but because they don't know until they apply the test. So you better safe than sorry, right? So there's some mathematics there of the, the cost of getting it wrong one way, a false positive versus, versus a false negative. If we can tip the odds a bit in those numbers game by putting probabilities, the output of the predictive model, and driving decisions accordingly, we can make a killing, right? And this is where the value of predicting better than guessing um, manifests. Uh, another question which you know a lot of people are curious about these days is about the evolution of this field and specifically about its future so how do you see the future shaped by these technologies and what gaps do you think still need to be paid attention to yeah great question well you know i think the main thing that's happening um uh i i think that futurism is going to be out of style within five years that that that's a <laughs> That's a self-referential joke. But um, I think that uh, the most exciting is, to, is more of the same because really it's only the tip of the iceberg as far as actually successfully deployed machine learning projects. There's, there's so much excitement. It's such a fad right now, which is cool, obviously, when you're in the industry to see it take off like that. But the problem is a lot of it is empty hype in the sense that the actual value being achieved does not match 
the level of hype. And the hype comes from two sides. One is the outsiders who aren't actually involved with the technology and they're being hyperbolic. The other is the core technology practitioners who love to revel in the data. And that's my background. That's where this is exactly where I'm coming from. Um, so this is a, a self course correction as much as an industry course correction that I'm um, uh, espousing. So uh, which is when you get really excited about the number crunching, the potential of what these models could achieve is obviously in the back of your head. You know, you know, it's potentially valuable if only the organization, the business would make use of it by deploying it. But you're um, ultimately your main focus is on the actual number crunching pro process, the predictive modeling algorithm, the way that it uh, ascertains general generalities from the data. Right. That's the learning process. That's cool. It's amazing. It's the most exciting kind of science and technology, in my opinion, more exciting than rocket science. Um, uh, but the value only comes when it gets deployed. So the main thing that's missing in this, uh, industry is not a technology problem, but a management problem, a leader, a, a lack of the right leadership process to ensure that a project f from its conception is designed in a way that's going to lead to business success, not just technical success. Wow, that is definitely a very exciting space to keep a track of in the future mm -hmm. as well. And I was also recently reading an article about how machine learning and AI are crucial to scale the metaverse and develop a truly decentralized web or web 3.0. So can you demystify the role of AI and ML being the forerunners of these new spaces uh, that we are soon, uh, you know, going to witness in the future? No. <laughs> um, actually, I, I can't. Maybe you can help me. Well, let's talk about this. So I don't get the metaverse. I see that as a, a type of hype that's similar to the AI hype. And, um, and, I, and I'm not really sure what, what, how to clearly define Web 3.0. So um, uh, I don't know. I mean, you could use machine learning to try to predict which people are most likely to be excited about the metaverse. Um, I'm, I haven't uh, looked into it that much, but my sense is that the metaverse is, is just another buzzword and the concept of virtual reality has been li lurking for a long time. Um, I don't know, you know, uh, I don't know, man. I Tell me though, I'm, I'm not my jury is still out. Like I'm not a hundred percent decided, but I don't see, I don't see uh, a, a big impending uh, revolution in the form of a, some kind of metaverse um, coming anytime soon. Um, you know, we see technology incrementally changing our daily activities, but um, what you and I are doing right now, talking by vi by video is fine we don't need to go into a space and avatar it like why would we do that i don't get it sorry yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is what i was wondering the other day like why do we actually need to go into the virtual world we can still use zoom or maybe the software which we are using well, right now my hair my hair wouldn't be as gray so <laughs> but I, some yeah, people like my gray hair so maybe it should be gray maybe i'll make it even more gray in the metaverse <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and uh, uh i'm also you know uh, very curious to know about the series and movies recommendations that we usually get on netflix or any other platform these days so is that somewhere based on uh predictive modeling and if so how can a company compete with its competitors on the basis of that recommendation engine and essentially what I mean to ask is what makes one recommendation engine better than the others? That's a great question. So the Netflix recommendation engine, one of the most famous ones, because they um, produced the very first predictive modeling competition uh, with a large prize. So it was a million dollars for the first party. So any group of people or individual anywhere in the world who could download their data set create a predictive model that would improve their movie recommendation system by 10%. And any the first person who achieved that 10% would then be qualified. Then there'd be another, uh, I think it was 30 days for others to try to catch up so they can 
uh, so it would trigger this 30 day countdown. And then in the end, the winner gets a million dollars. And it's a great story, and they pulled it off. Now, it's sort of a perfect example of the business problem because they didn't parameterize it. You could do, you could make as complex a model as you wanted. So the the story is that in the end, this improved model was not actually directly used by Netflix. But the research and development advancements of it, the main um, technical achievement that took place, uh, or the technical method that was sort of core to the improvements. Um, during this contest, which went on for almost a year, um, is the teams used something called an ensemble model. An ensemble model is basically a bunch of small models that all vote. And it's, it's a way that you, if you're familiar with the concept, the wisdom of the crowd, yeah. um, this is a wisdom of a crowd of models. And so any model has um, uh, uh, limitations, so it's going to get some predictions wrong. But one model may have different kind of limitations than another. Can they can they kind of compensate for one another? Well, if you've got a whole group of them voting, just like any individual human is going to have limitations in how well they can make predictions. But if you have a whole group of humans or of models voting, that turns out to make a big difference. So the teams that did the best were the ones that were using these ensemble models. And then... In the end, the teams had to team up. So you create these meta teams where teams would be like, you know, if I win, I'm going to get a million dollars. If I lose, I get nothing. It would be better to, to pair up with these competitors, create a meta team, and then if we win, we each get half a million dollars, but that's better than losing. And the way that they would take their different models, that they'd, they may have completely separate technical approaches, was they would have the models um, ensembled together. So essentially they would vote together or be combined in some other simple way. So um, ensembling is the way that teams joined into meta teams. And only by doing that were they able to qualify for the 10% and then eventually win um, the, the million dollar prize with Netflix. So taking a step back, um, product recommendations, whatever it's mo whether it's movies or otherwise, um, are... Um, are one of those business applications actually where I would say that the return on investment is harder um, to measure. So in that sense, uh, a little less sexy to the boardroom when you show a PowerPoint, you say, well, this is why we want to improve the, the um, recommendations because it's, it's, it's very indirect to connect that level of customer satisfaction, to measure how that affects customer satisfaction and then how that in turn affects the business and, you know, retention of customers, et cetera. Um, I mean, when you're looking at product recommendations, all of us as consumers, we don't really know exactly how accurate these are. Yeah. And we sure yeah. know that they're often wrong. So yeah. certainly it's predicting better than guessing. And there's some value there, but it's very hard to measure exactly what the value is. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Now, you know, coming on to talking a bit about the dark side of analytics, AI and machine learning. So do you think it has a dark side? And uh, what do you think we as engineers, AI experts, or maybe tech enthusiasts uh, uh, can do to ensure that these models that we are building are ethical in nature and not in any form manipulative or polarizing? Um, so I take the ethical issues between machine learning very seriously and i have <laughs> for a decade now um and i've actually written a lot of uh published a lot of op eds so opinion articles in the newspaper and 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 such um about these topics so if you want to see my writing about it it's at you can go to civilrightsdata.com um and that'll link to all my articles but basically um i'm quite concerned about this concept of bias which is a subjective word it has to be defined and discrimination in models. Um, and I see that um, data analysis can often be used as a rationalization for discrimination. And this is coming out. So it's sort of the last, um, it, it's, it's, it's the last and latest uh, big push by people who would treat people differently based on their group because they're saying they're not being irrational, they're simply being rational. And I push back hard against that. And I say, you can't have a model 
that explicitly treats people differently by their protected groups, by, you know, by race, national, national origin, and these things. That's just, that's just fundamental. That's nothing, that's the very definition of prejudice, prejudging somebody based on the individual category. Um, the, the perhaps more, even more difficult to um, uh, address and more, more widely discussed issue it, often under the word bias, is that even if the model does not take the protected, the protected class as an input, it still ascertains it indirectly by way of proxies. So you still, if you look at the behavior of a model for crime prediction, for credit scoring, for things where it's making high or informing high stakes decisions that have a dramatic impact on pe individuals' lives, um, <clears throat> it turns out it's going to be treating different groups of people differently. And the bottom line, jump, jump straight to the uh, bottom line here, it's a difference in false positive rates. So the focus is not so much on whether it tends to um, put a higher risk score probability of crime or bad credit behavior or whatever you're trying to predict on uh, a certain group of people, but whether it falsely flags those people proportionally more often than other groups. So if there's a historically disadvantaged group, um, is the model being unfair in that way? So it's, it's a really big political, I'll call it a religious de battle taking place around this. Um, and there's very little common understanding of even what the ethical questions are in the first place. So there's a tremendous amount of work to be done, uh, clarifying, getting the terminology straight, and even beginning to have any kind of meaningful um, discussions between what are largely two sides, just the same as the political polarity in this country um, of, of, the, of politics. Now, you know, let's move on to some questions about your current role, since we have already discussed so much about the ethical side of AI and all of that. So uh, can you tell us about uh, how your day, how your usual day looks like, and can you walk us through the kind of work you do on a daily basis, so that you know our listeners can have a glimpse of what it's like to be like a, a data scientist and an AI expert. Um, well, uh, sure. My my days vary very differently since I work for myself and I have a lot of different projects that go in different waves. So, um. A central focus to my consulting career since 2009 has been the Predictive Analytics Conference Series, which uh, it, we're coming back to in-person events this year in 2022. And our main events are in Vegas in June and also at, also in June in Munich, Germany. And um, so the, the main conference is called Predictive Analytics World. As I mentioned earlier, we have a bunch of vertical focused sort of sub conferences and they're all held aside one another. So again, these, these different fields, uh, PAW is the name of the conference, PAW Business, Financial Services, Industry 4.0, Healthcare, um, Climate Technology, and um, the sister conference, Deep Learning World, where deep learning is the hottest uh, advanced form of machine learning. Um, so under these conferences all come together under the umbrella event, which we call Machine Learning Week. So um, because it's annual, my my work on the conferences, you know, varies month to month, depending, right? There's a lot of work lining up the speakers um, and figuring out the right topics for this year's event. Um, uh, but I'm also, so I've also just launched a podcast um, and I haven't oh, wow. done interviews yet, but um, I'm covering these, to each, each episode just covers a different one of these particular topics and it's called The Dr. <laughs> Data Show. So Dr. Data is a uh, um, is a name I'm trying to claim. I want people to call me Doctor Data. But, you know, you don't usually give yourself a nickname, so I'm not sure if it's ever going to really work. I have a couple friends who every once in a while say "Hello, Doctor Data," and they're just kind of making fun of me. So, uh, in any case, um, uh, DoctorDataShow.com. We've only we've only uh, got four or five episodes out so far. Um, so that that's a lot of fun. Um, before the pandemic, I was speaking at a lot of other people's conferences, especially after the book. Um, uh, I'm looking at writing another book. I'm writing more articles on social justice. 
Um, I'm the executive editor of Machine Learning Times. So if you go to machinelearningtimes.com, that's our online news portal. So I'm sort of juggling a bunch of stuff, and depending on the week, you know, the focus is on one or the other. Um, does that answer your question, or are there other things about my daily schedule or something like that <laughs> that you that you wanted to ask? No, that definitely answers my question. And uh, also, you know, we are living in this new era of the scale economy where a lot of emphasis is being laid both on the soft as well as the hard skills. So what are those chunk of skills which people who are interested in the space should acquire, uh, or should start acquiring actually? Uh, and number one, for people who don't come from a tech background, and number two, who come from a tech background? Well, as I've been mentioning, you know, the the biggest omission, the biggest problem, the biggest hole that needs to be filled in this space is, is the business side leadership practices, mm -hmm. the right management of it, the right understanding of, of any and all people at an organization that are going to be affected by or touched by or, in, or in, involved in any way with a machine learning project. Um, because machine learning, the word refers to the core technology, but if an organization is using it, it's a lot more than that's just one component of it. It's about how are you changing existing operations? It's a change management thing. It's a big um, paradigm shift for the organization. <clears throat> So with that in mind, if you're not on the technical side, but you're interested, great. What you need to learn is relatively lightweight on the technical side, but you do need to get into it somewhat. You need to understand the performance measures. So people always throw around the word accuracy. How accurate is this model? How well does it predict in terms of accuracy? It turns out accuracy is not quite the right measure. There's other things like false positive rate, costs, uh, what's called lift or gains. Um, and it's all just arithmetic, but it's very particular arithmetic. And this is the kind of thing that uh, everyone needs to know, even if you're not the rocket scientist, even if you're not the data scientist, even if you're not the one in charge of producing the model by hand, there's a whole, there's a whole knowledge base and skill set around understanding and setting expectations around how well this model is going to predict and how much of an improvement that's going to make for the business. Um, so the understanding of that in a very concrete, down-to-earth way, this is exactly the operation that will be improved. This is how it will be improved. This is the type. This is how we're going to measure the improvement. This is what we hope for that measurement. Um, the the key KPI, um, key performance indicator on that end of it. Indicators. Um, the, that, that area is very, it doesn't get very much attention, and that's why most models fail to actually uh, get green light at the end and they don't deploy. Um, and that's where your involvement in a machine learning project can have such a great impact and it can make all the difference between a, um, some really great number crunching that produces a really interesting model that never actually gets used. The difference between that and a actually successful uh, machine learning project that, that um, has an impact and affects major large-scale processes in a positive way so basically understanding the quantitative aspects of machine learning really helps even if you are from non, uh, a non-tech background that's right yep okay and and is it essential to you know maybe learn programming like if someone is coming from a business background like i do so how does someone you know venture into this space with a business background well, like depends. what all steps should one take well, if you want to become a data scientist, then yes. If you don't want to become the hands-on data scientist and your involvement is more on the business side, <laughs> so let's say you're a line of business manager and you're in charge of the operations that, have, that um, oversee uh, fraud investigations and you're overseeing um, a team of fraud investigators and every day they sit down and they look at all these transactions and man manually try to determine whether they're fraudulent. The time spent by those people would be a lot more effective if you had a system that was giving them transactions that are much more likely than average to be fraudulent. That's the value of deploying machine learning. Um, if you're overseeing that group and therefore you're the line of business manager you're going to have to work very closely with the data scientists. You don't have to be a data scientist and you don't have to do programming yourself. Okay. 
thank you so much for sharing that eric and now coming on to the rapid fire round of the show so let me okay. know if you are ready and we can start with it all right, all right. i'm ready perfect so, i don't know what's so, coming but <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so hey we go in 3 2 1 uh, one industry you are absolutely bullish about in the future uh well machine learning uh okay <laughs> <laughs> and one major trend in the data world that entrepreneurs can utilize a trend in the data that people that entrepreneurs can utilize so you say yeah yeah um oh well the one i mentioned earlier that survey result which by the way wasn't wasn't the first there's other ones that we that have uh, just a handful this this reaffirmed the same result most predictive mm-hmm. modeling projects are failing So the opportunity there is before we hit another AI winter and there's disillusionment and the stuff hits the fan and the executives get wise um come in as the hero and make this thing work end to end. So follow that trend. Yeah. And best use of uh, best use case of predictive analytics you have seen so far. Or the you have been personally thing? involved. Yeah. Oh. Like one well, of your personal favorites. Oh, okay. Uh well, I mean, in terms of my own project uh work, you know, we we got a ROI um well, an improvement of a a million dollars revenue every 14 months by better targeting ads, right? So you do, so that's sort of the magic of of making things more effective and efficient and, and predicting better than guessing is even if a system's been relatively streamlined, what you're doing is improving the intelligence of all these relatively small individual decisions that add up to something great. So if you're serving ads to people, it's not that you're getting new advertisers, it's not that there's new creatives in the ads. All you're doing is making a better decision about which ad to show to which person and it and it's automatically um generating value. Um but then in terms of sort of what's uh close to my heart on another level i think that a lot of the world changing world improving models um uh for social good are great so we've got a whole predictive analytics world conference on climate technology you can check that out um people are using predictive analytics to better the targeting of uh investigations uh, uh for children that that may be at risk of neglect and abuse um there's so many ways that you know there's re there's better rehabilitating of teens can be targeted there's so many ways that this improvement of efficiency tr- can translate into social good well that's really interesting and i will definitely check out the climate technology one since i'm really interested uh, towards that field and one mistake and one learning from your career Mis- mistake oh uh <laughs> <clears throat> Well, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, uh I would say that I participated in two startup companies that had uh a lack of focus. You need to have a ruthless focus on one particular um market segment as a as any any kind of business. Um and even if you're an individual you only have one business, right? So I kind of learned that lesson and I think that I corrected from it in a way that that worked. Well, wow, that was a really interesting round. Uh, also, what would be your advice to the aspiring data scientists, students or anyone across the world who is interested in this field and also if you could share any book or podcast recommendations? Sure. Um you know, when you're entering a new field, the most important thing is what feels exciting to you. Uh with one caveat. <laughs> so start with that. And what that means if you're if you're a data science uh data scientist to be um you'll probably be the same as 99% of the others and the same as who I was um 30 years ago. Um where the excitement was about the core technology and all you wanted to do is actually start number crunching. That is you want to download the software or program something from scratch. you want to download the data or generate the data somehow and then try it out um and that's exciting and it's the 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 thing the caveat is that 
don't forget while you're going down that avenue and taking any one of the vast majority of machine learning trainings for hands-on is that you're still missing 50% of the equation. And if you want to get ahead of the vast majority of your colleagues, and if you want to make a course correction that this industry is going, if you want to be ahead of the curve and make that correction before the industry slams up against a wall, go to the business side. Um, learn about the management practice that's needed, the change management, the planning. I mean, basically, a machine learning project has to be planned in reverse. You have to start with, hey, how is this thing going to get deployed? What's the change to operations? Can I get the people in charge of those operations interested? Are they even going to consider deploying it? And you better sort of actually get to the, get them to the point of great enthusiasm and agreement before the overall project even starts at all. So jumping straight into that core technology, the number crunching first is generally the wrong order. It's putting the cart before the horse, you know, as they say. Um, so uh, that would be my main uh, uh, suggestion is if you're feeling excited about the tech side, great. That'll help your learning curve. But remember, you're only learning half of what needs to be learned. And also, do you have any book or podcast recommendations? Yeah, I mean, so the so 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 my course is unusual in that it addresses the business side, um, uh, and I have trouble finding other courses that are actually covering the technology side in a concrete way that does that. Um, and the same thing is true about books. So, you know, if you're really um, if you're really um, on the deep side of the of the um, the courses, I still love the original academic textbook called Machine Learning. I feel like that sets the foundation of what this field is. But if you know that your focus is specifically on deep learning, obviously there's an extremely popular Andrew Ng deep learning Coursera course that yeah. uh, has taken the field by storm. Um, again, if you're doing that, you're only on that one half, as I've mentioned, um, or anything like that. Um, if you know exactly which language you would like to use it, whether it's Python or SAS or um, R, you know you can choose your course according to that particular class. But on the business on the business side, I have to take a bigger step back and go back to a classic, which is called Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore. Um, this this book may now be more than twenty years old, although it's been updated. And this is the classic for what it means for an entrepreneur. Um, to, talk, to, to focus and to define that market segment, that niche to which you're mm -hmm. um, selling. And, you know, I was also reading about this uh, very interesting concept of the beachhead market. So this term beachhead actually, you know, comes from the military where you uh, land on a beach in the middle of an ocean. And mm -hmm. that's how you focus on that specific market or the niche market, which you are talking about. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, it was, you know, really wonderful uh, speaking to you today. And I got to learn a lot from our discussion over here about the amazing world of machine learning, AI and a lot more. So thank you so much for taking out the time for being on the show. And I wish you the best. My, yeah, my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me, Surya. Mm -hmm.